everyone, welcome to Bite Size Med, where we talk about quick bite-sized concepts in basic medical sciences for study and rapid review. This video is on the respiratory changes at high altitude. Understanding the respiratory response to high altitude requires application of most of the physiology concepts in respiration. So if during this video you feel like you need help on any of the concepts I talk about, you can check the links in the description box below. There are lots of changes in respiration and circulation that take place as one ascends to higher altitudes. The basic cause is the change in barometric pressure. At sea level, atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. With ascent, it reduces. So at around 50,000 feet, it'll be 87. Proportionately, the inspired oxygen will also reduce from 160 to around 18. The changes that take place are to make the person more accustomed to these conditions of low oxygen in the air, to reduce the harmful effects on the body. This is called acclimatization. Acclimatizing to high altitudes includes changes in ventilation and in circulation. So first let's look at the changes in ventilation. There's reduced inspired oxygen which means the alveoli have low oxygen as well. That's the capital A. So there's reduced oxygen entering the capillaries. That's the small a. The changes in oxygen levels in the blood are detected by peripheral chemoreceptors, the carotid and the aortic bodies. Normal arterial oxygen is around 100. These receptors are insensitive to arterial oxygen until it drops to less than 60. The low arterial oxygen is called hypoxemia. Hypoxia is reduced oxygen utilization or delivery to tissues. So hypoxemia is one of the causes of hypoxia, and high altitude can result in hypoxemic hypoxia. So once the arterial oxygen drops to less than 60, the peripheral chemoreceptors get stimulated. And via the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerves, the respiratory centers get stimulated, increasing ventilation. During ventilation, oxygen exchanges with carbon dioxide. Oxygen enters the capillaries and carbon dioxide leaves. So more ventilation means more carbon dioxide loss, and the arterial carbon dioxide levels fall. High carbon dioxide would increase hydrogen ions. So if there's low carbon dioxide, that means there's low hydrogen ions and a higher pH. Since the primary cause for the pH to increase was a change in partial pressure of carbon dioxide, this is respiratory alkalosis. The low carbon dioxide inhibits the central chemoreceptors. The central chemoreceptors respond to hydrogen ions. So the carbon dioxide crosses the blood-brain barrier, binds with water, and by carbonic anhydrase becomes carbonic acid, which dissociates into the hydrogen ion and the bicarb ion. The low hydrogen ions inhibit these chemoreceptors and reduce the excess ventilation. This happens first, and then the kidney takes over, reduces hydrogen ion secretion and bicarb reabsorption, and increases bicarb elimination. So the CSF pH normalizes. Now again, the low oxygen from the peripheral chemoreceptors stimulates ventilation. Next, the changes in circulation. There are hypoxia-inducible factors, which are DNA-binding transcription factors. They work in hypoxia to ensure oxygen delivery to tissues. They control genes like the erythropoietin gene and glycolytic enzyme genes. When there's reduced oxygen delivery to the kidney, that stimulates the production of hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. This acts on the fibroblasts of the renal cortex and the medulla, increasing erythropoietin synthesis. Erythropoietin causes the differentiation of pro-erythroblasts, so there's increased RBC production, and polycythemia. So there's increased hemoglobin concentration, which increases the oxygen-carrying capacity, and therefore the oxygen content of blood. So there's a low arterial partial pressure of oxygen, but there's a high oxygen content of blood. This helps the tissues get oxygen. 
but it also increases blood viscosity. If you recall, resistance is 8 eta L over pi r to the power of 4, where eta is the viscosity. So resistance is proportional to viscosity, and high blood viscosity means there's a high pulmonary vascular resistance and high pulmonary arterial pressure. Increased RBC glycolysis increases 2,3-diphosphoglycerate. This 2,3-DPG binds to the beta chains of hemoglobin, reducing its affinity for oxygen, and that shifts the oxygen dissociation curve to the right. There's an increased P50, and right releases, so there's more oxygen released to the tissues. Hypoxia affects the pulmonary vessels differently than systemic vessels. There's hypoxic vasoconstriction. Systemic vessels dilate in response to low oxygen, while pulmonary vessels constrict. So that increases the pulmonary vascular resistance and the pulmonary arterial pressure. This can increase back pressure on the right ventricle, causing right ventricular hypertrophy. An adverse consequence of this effect of oxygen on vessels is seen in acute mountain sickness when someone ascends too rapidly. Local dilation of cerebral vessels increases blood flow, so there's high capillary pressure. And from what we know about starling forces, that can cause increased filtration and so acute cerebral edema. The constriction of vessels in the lungs pushes blood through the unconstricted vessels. So that increases capillary pressure there. And again, by increased filtration, there's pulmonary edema. And this is called high-altitude pulmonary edema. In chronic mountain sickness, the RBCs and hematocrit increase a lot. So there's more blood viscosity that actually reduces tissue blood flow and can reduce oxygen delivery to the tissues. Hypoxic vasoconstriction is meant to be protective. Give blood to the better ventilated alveoli. In chronic mountain sickness, all of the alveoli are in a low oxygen state, so all the arterioles constrict, increasing the pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary arterial pressure by a lot. This can cause the right heart to fail. If this video helped you, give it a thumbs up, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.